So, this is now chapter 5, part 1. And I suppose I should have said that, yeah? So everybody, we're going to start chapter 5 now. I'm going to try to get a good little dent into chapter 5, part 1. Okay? Starting, and here's a little question. What will happen if we put a bacteria into distilled water with lysozyme? So will undergo osmotic lysis, yeah? It's, so what I'll talk about is that answer is, is certainly theoretically correct. That's the answer I'm looking for here. But we'll, we'll talk a little more about the details of whether that would really happen or not um, after we talk about enzymes. And enzymes are about a large part of Chapter 5. And Chapter 5 um, is happening right now. Okay, so we'll talk about... Uh, I'll introduce things, ATP, metabolic diversity, and enzymes. Some learning objectives. So, what happens to a swab a nurse takes from a patient? So, we, uh, uh, we have a person sticking a long rod-like device into a patient's nose. Boy, is that an invasion of personal privacy or what? Um, and yet, that happens all the time, yeah? Why would this lady be so rude to this poor lady here? For science, that's right. Also for medicine, for her personal health, right? Right? As nurses, maybe we don't give a rat's about science, but we do care about making people healthy, yeah? What do you think? Why would, where, where is, we want to know if this person has an infection, yeah? So where is the swab going to go? It goes to the microbiology lab, yeah? Maybe this person is the nurse, yeah? And uh, takes it to the microbiology lab. And then um, what kind of test, what's, what's the job of the microbiology lab? Find out what kind of microbes are in that person's nose, yeah? And what kind of tests can we do? We can do a gram stain. Does that tell us a lot? Yeah, the gram stain is a differential test. Do you guys understand what a differential test is? In order to understand that term, we have to understand the term differential. To differentiate. Do you guys know what it means to differentiate? Yeah, so that's a huge, that is actually... The, what David said, to differentiate, strictly speaking, means to tell apart, right? But the way, when you guys have your unknowns, it will be far more important to find out what your unknowns are not. And then the only thing left is what your unknown is. Does that make sense? So there's a lot more force applied to eliminating candidate microbes. Does that make sense? So... Um, Gram stain is one differential test, right? It can tell us um, a lot about a bacteria. What can it tell us? What kind of cell wall it has, right? Do you, are there bacteria in this picture of a gram stain that have different kinds of cell walls? Yeah. Talk about that, somebody. Somebody raise your hand to talk about that. What kind of cell walls are we looking at in this picture? Yeah. Did you guys hear that? Um, so, if we see purple guys here, and this is a gram stain, we know these guys are gram positive. We know that they have several layers of peptidoglycan. If we see pink guys, we know those guys are gram negative, And they have one layer of peptidoglycan sandwiched in between two phospholipid bilayers, yeah? Right? Those are hugely important differences, right? One reason is because... Um, because the phospholipid bilayer on that gram-negative guy sort of protects the, the cell wall from things like lysozyme and, and, and to a lesser extent from things like penicillin and so on, right? The gram stain reveals important structures, structural differences between bacteria, right? Furthermore, we know a few other things. We know the shape of the bacteria, right? If we see these guys are spherical, 
we know those guys are gram positive because they're purple, and they're definitely not bacillus because they're spherical. Does that make sense? Right? Do we know, so these guys must be some kind of coccus bacteria, right? It looks like a staphylococcus. Do you guys know any staph, staph bacteria? Staph aureus. How many people have heard of staph aureus? How many people have heard of this bacterium? And I didn't spell it out. I, I put, I'll put a little period here after the staph. Staph aureus. Raise your hand if you've heard of staph aureus. How, somebody raise their hand. Somebody, there should be at least one person raising their hands because somebody said staph aureus. That was you. Okay. <laughs> put it in the air there, right? All right. See that? That dude knows staph aureus. Everybody else should know another kind of staph, right? Because we used it last week. And you wrote it down, didn't you, in your labs that you handed in today? You didn't hand them in, okay. I'll just tell you, staph epidermidis. Right? So this is Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis, yeah? These are bacteria you want to know, yeah? Are they pathogenic? Let me ask you about Staph, have, you haven't heard of Staph aureus, yeah? I had one person, we talked about Staph aureus and one person raised their hand. The rest of you guys must know, not know about Staph aureus. Well, let me ask you, have you heard of MRSA? MRSA? Raise your hand if you've heard of MRSA. That's methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. So if you've heard of MRSA, you've heard of Staph aureus in a slightly different context. Okay? You guys with me? All right. Is it a pathogen? Staph aureus is a pathogen. Yeah? What about Staph epidermidis? Do you think it's a pathogen? It's where do we find Staph epidermidis? On our skin. I mean, the name means skin. We probably do find some in our gut, but its primary place that we expect to see it is on our skin. Yeah? And it's, and it's certainly a lot less of a problem than Staph aureus. Yeah? So, can we tell them apart? Is this, the little purple ball guys here, are they Staph aureus or Staph epidermidis? We can't tell, yeah? Why not? Because they're both gram-positive. They're both Staphylococcus, yeah? They look similar, right? Why am I talking about this? Because what we see is that the gram stain tells us a lot of important information, but it doesn't tell us everything, right? It doesn't, and in the case of this guy, it doesn't tell us whether we've got a pathogen that we should be worried about or a non-pathogenic guy that we should not care about at all. Does that make sense? Right? So, so we have, the gram stain is a useful test, but it is limited, like all tests, yeah? And we have found its limits, and its limits ain't good enough to identify for this poor lady, whether she's got a pathogen or whether she doesn't. Does that make sense? So, chapter 5 is about another way to differentiate bacteria. And that is implicit in this diagram here. Metabolic tests can differentiate bacteria. That means tell them apart and rule some out beyond the precision of stains. Yeah? Right? In other words, rather than just looking at their structural differences, let's look at their metabolic differences. Do you understand the difference there? Structural differences. That means how your cell wall is built. Yeah? Metabolic differences. What is metabolism? You remember that. What's metabolism? That's the kinds of chemical reactions you can do. Yeah? 
So all these guys were gram negative rods, just like we might see here, right? We see gram negative rods here. Should we be worried or should we not be worried? Well, if we do a metabolic test, we can make a better judgment about whether we should care that there are gram negative bacteria in this gram stain or not. You guys got it? Are these guys all the same? This guy is E. coli. This guy, Shigella. This guy, Proteus vulgaris. This guy, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Have you heard of any of these guys? Pseudomonas is, is essentially the leading cause of death of people with cystic fibrosis, yeah? Most people with cystic fibrosis die of bacterial lung infections, and nearly all of those bacterial lung infections are pseudomonas infections, yeah? It also causes urinary tract infections, yeah? So if you've got a urine sample and you see pseudomonas, somebody should be concerned, yeah? What about E. coli? Is that a pathogen? Can be, but most strains of E. coli are not pathogenic, right? Everybody in this class has got E. coli in their guts. I think it's pretty safe to say, yeah? All right, so, some of, and we can see they've all been put on the same media. They've all been put on to a slant auger, and they're all doing different things to it, yeah? E. coli is turning it all yellow. This guy, Shigella, is turning the, the butt yellow, and the slant is red. This guy is turning the butt black, and the slant is still red, and this guy is not changing it very much at all. Does that make sense? Right? And that's based on my knowing already that this slant is starting out sort of a reddish color. Yeah? You guys good with that? So, and the reason they're doing that is because these guys can do different chemical reactions to the same stuff. Got it? Okay. All right. So, we're differentiating bacteria based on metabolic diversity. So chapter five is about learning about the kinds of metabolic diversity that we can suss out with tests. You understand? All right. Cool. So let us learn. Um, all the chemical reactions performed by a living thing is that particular thing's metabolism. Yeah? We can have anabolic reactions that build up molecules. Or we can have catabolic reactions that break things down, yeah? And the cata catabolism and anabolism of various um, things is different for, different for everybody, yeah? And different for all microbes. Microbes are able to perform many chemical reactions no other living things can do, right? And so we can break down bacteria based on their <coughs> metabolic characteristics. We can... We can differentiate bacteria based on whether they're autotrophs or heterotrophs. Yeah? Um, so heterotrophs get their energy from food, right? Yogurt has bacteria in it, yeah? What do the bacteria eat? Everyone should know what yogurt bacteria eat. What do they eat? That's, I don't want to say he's wrong. Does yogurt start out as yogurt? Before you add bacteria to it, what is yogurt? It's milk, yeah? So they eat milk and they turn it into yogurt. And, but I guess once it becomes yogurt, I don't think they immediately starve to death. So I guess, because they're still alive, yeah, I guess they eat yogurt. That's true. Um, but it starts as milk, and by, the, and by eating it, they turn it into yogurt, yeah? You guys with me here? Okay. What about, what about these guys? Are they eating, are these guys eating milk on the right side? They don't eat milk. What do they eat? I guess you could say they eat sunlight, although that sounds a little weird. They capture, they capture energy from the sun, and they use it to do anabolic processes. In other words, they can build up small molecules into big ones. That's a reaction that requires energy. The energy they're using is sunlight energy to do that. You guys got that? All right. So, metabolism. All the chemical reactions, we have 
anabolic reactions and catabolic reactions on the right. And we, we build things up by dehydration synthesis and we break them down by hydrolysis, yeah? Okay. Why do we care? As we've said before, microbial metabolism can tell us the difference between microbes that we see on the left, H. pylori, we can test with a urease test, yeah? But as it, so, so the fact that H. pylori has urease allows us to know whether or not somebody's got H. pylori. You guys got that? How many people have heard of H. pylori? Right? How many people are like, boy, this is interesting. I would love to do their presentation. I mean, I want to do my presentation on H. pylori. That's good that you're not raising your hands because it's taken. Yeah? So don't even think about it. Is that clear? Yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just pulling chains. I hope, I hope, I hope everyone sees the, the bad humor in my little wisecracks. Yeah? Okay. So H. pylori has an enzyme called urease. Yeah? Metabolism is heritable and can facilitate identification by medical microbiologists. Yeah? Take a bacterium that is H. pylori, put it in a tube with urea and a pH indicator, um, phenolphthalein. You do that, and H. pylori can grow, and when they grow, they break down the urea, and when they do, they make... Do you guys know what urea is? Urea is a small molecule. Here it is. It's got two am amine groups. It's the way your body gets rid of nitrogen. And after you eat a cheeseburger, a lot of the amino acids that you eat, um, you break off the amino group from those amino acids, you burn the carbon, and then those amino groups have to be gotten rid of. If we don't do anything to them, there'll be NH3, which is ammonia. And ammonia is basic, and it's toxic. Yeah? Right? That's why we don't drink ammonia. Yeah? Um, so, we have to get, but, but it's a metabolic waste product. When we eat amino acids, ammonia is formed. Right? And that ammonia is toxic, so it'll mess us up. So what do we do? We covalently bond it to a carbon atom. Yeah? And when we do that, it becomes less toxic. Urea is a waste product. We have to get rid of it, but having it in our bloodstream is a lot less of a big deal than having ammonia in our bloodstream. Okay? So we can take this molecule, and then we can get rid of it. We can dump it in our pee. Yeah? We pee it out. And that's what urine is mostly made out of, is urea. Yeah? Or a largely made out of. Okay. So, but bacteria, this molecule, even though it's still got a carbon atom, right? It's still got covalent bonds. And as it turns out, H. pylori can eat it. Yeah? They can eat it and they can get energy from it. Right? And as it turns out, there's a little bit of urea. Um, most of it's supposed to be peed out, but some of it is in your stomach. Some of it is on your skin. You sweat out a little bit of urea. Yeah? Okay. So this guy can eat it. A lot of other guys can't. Right? You put H. pylori onto this slant. And it grows, and when it grows, it makes ammonia because it eats the urea that's in the nutrients, yeah? You guys following? All right, so it eats the urea, makes ammonia, and when it makes ammonia, the pH changes and the tube turns pink, yeah? Take another bacterium, E. coli, put that on a slant, and it doesn't turn the media pink. Why? Because it doesn't have urease, yeah? It doesn't have the enzyme that can break this apart. Does that make sense? All right. So, we can, we can use this test to tell if somebody has, has H. pylori in their gut instead of, instead of E. coli. Yeah? Does that make sense? So, in other words, we can use the difference in metabolic characteristics between E. coli and... H. pylori to identify them, right? Uh, we can know that somebody's got an H. pylori infection 
by the way that their metabolism is different from the metabolism of a lot of other bacteria. There's another reason why we should care about the metabolic characteristics of bacteria. And that is because the metabolic characteristics are themselves what can make you sick. And as it turns out, urease in H. pylori helps it do its job as a, as a pathogen of your stomach. Did you guys know that H. pylori can cause ulcers? David will be talking to you about that in a few weeks. But suffice it in a cloud of base. Does that make sense? That neutralizes that acid. Okay? Is that good? Okay. Moving on. So, we can classify microbes according to the metabolic processes they can perform. Phototrophs, chemotrophs, these are things, these are classifications based on where our energy source is. What our energy source is. What is your energy source? as a person. ATP, what do you think? It's true for every living thing, not including chemotrophs and phototrophs, yeah? So, when I had breakfast this morning, I did not pour ATP on my cereal, yeah? What did I have for breakfast? I had food, right? So, yes, our cells use ATP, but we eat food and we convert the food energy to ATP energy, yeah? Does everybody use ATP? Yes. Does everybody eat food to get their ATP? No. 
Who doesn't? The guy in the yogurt, is he getting his energy from food? Yes. The, his food is what? Milk, yeah? What about the other guy? Was his energy food? No, it was sunlight, right? So his energy source is sunlight instead of food. Does that make sense? Right? All right. So are we on this list? Yes, we are, all organisms. So where do we get our energy? Are we chemotrophs or are we phototrophs? We are chemotrophs because we're getting our energy from chemicals. Because food is chemicals, yeah? Okay. All right, good. So next question, after energy source, source of carbon atoms, right, for anabolic manufacture of molecules is a vital criterion, right? So where do you get your energy? Answer, we get our energy from food, yeah? Next question is,
Back. Section five. More speed. Four seven. Thank you. 